We are telling you earlier on, we have a one-on-one -on -one interview exclusive with former Senator Beth Mugo, who, Vicky, according to Vicky, is a trailblazer in many ways. Not just to me. I can say the country can attest to that. And here's the book, The Early Bird. Yeah. Beautiful cover there. Absolutely. Almost 600 pages. Almost 600 pages. And it's littered with incredible pictures. That's what I noticed right away. It's a walk through history. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Beth Mugo joins us live in the studio. Welcome, Senator. Good to see you. Thank you, Jeff. And congratulations on the book. Thank you. We've been mulling the word early bird, both of us. We're wondering, is it that famous saying, the early bird catches the worm? Uh-huh, part of it. Uh -huh. But there's a real story to it. Uh, I'm sure you know, before I joined politics, I was very much into women movement, uh, both regional, local, uh, national, and international. And then when I was, I was elected the coordinator for the Africa region, and then vice president mm. of the International Federation of Business and Professional Women, I was conducting seminars and workshops, presiding in the region. And one such uh, workshop in Botswana, mm. which actually our own Ruth Kagea, when she was in World Bank, was assigned to come and do the keynote by the World Bank. At the end of that, I was presented with that eagle, the bird mm -hmm. eagle. And they told me to fly high and high like an eagle uh -huh. and never get tired and renew myself like an eagle and come down again. And then, as fate would have it, or luck, when I was appointed minister for public health and sanitation, Kenyatta, Hospital, Kenyatta University yeah. were opening their mortuary. They invited me as the chief guest. And at the end of it, they presented me with another eagle. <laughs> so I said, there must be something in this eagles with Beth Mugo. Yeah. And I think it joins very much with the early bird, because when you read the me memoir, yeah. you see there are quite a few things when I, where I was the early bird. I was either the starter or very close to that. Yeah, absolutely. So yes, that's how the early bird came to be. Nice. You mentioned this is a memoir of your life. I'm sure as you went through writing, some moments came up. What uh, were some that you feel, my goodness, I forgot all about this moment <laughs> that hit you once again and brought back that memory? I think one of them, which still remains very fresh to me and as not special but dynamic, mm. is my is the cancer, mm. my fight with the cancer. That was heavy. That was quite an experience. Moments of doom thinking, is this, is this it? Yeah. Am I going to get through it? And then after that, feeling very confident and not really worrying and not thinking, being very positive. I did not now see death. I saw living. Have a lot of women come to you since asking you, how did you beat this? Mm. How do, yes, uh, yeah. yes, quite a lot. And as you know, I, I started the Beth Mogo Cancer Foundation, which we screened. Yeah. Actually, last Sunday, I saw you did screen yes. Yes. here in the news. Yes. We were in St. Mark uh, screening for cancer. So we also give lecture on top. I have quite a few professionals who have been trained, nurses, doctors who do this. And they used to ask me a lot, the women. Mm. But then we started doing this. Now they ask a lot, the, the, the professionals. Uh, but on how I personally beat the cancer, they do still ask me. I tell them the secret is really screening being found early, because you know cancer doesn't hurt. So early, in early stages. So you can only know through screening. And when they catch it early, before it gets into the blood, starts spreading, the doctors say it's easier to cure. Mm. And that's what happened to me. I was very fortunate. I had actually come, I had a mammogram 
and sometime in April, and it was not found. Yeah. Uh, I usually did mammogram regularly, yearly. And then that was April, about November or so, or close to December, I was coming from a conference, a medical, I mean, a doctor's conference from Brazil. And somehow I came straight to parliament. There was a very touchy question, which I personally had to answer, not even my assistant minister. And on my way home, I started feeling nausea. And uh, my security, my driver, they said, no, uh, let us stop at MP Shah instead of going home. We are going home. And when they did, uh, they did some tests, they told me that I need further investigation. And do I have a personal doctor? Yes, I said, Dr. Matenge. Mm -hmm. And when they called Dr. Matenge and explained, they said, he said to come to Nairobi Hospital because that's where his clinic is. And I was admitted. And they found that there was um, a vein, a small vein that had been blocked. Mm -hmm. And that's what was causing, not quite heart attack, but was causing uh, this to happen. Mm. And then Dr. Madenge insisted I do cancer also test now that he got me in hospital, which had been difficult to get me in the hospital mm. to do this. And that's a problem with many leaders. We, we get ourselves too busy instead of worrying about our health. I told him I just had mammogram and he said, let's do another one still. So that's when they did the, what they call the breast with the, now not the mammogram, MRI. I believe it was MRI. And that's what found the lump now on my right hand uh, breast. And they did not tell me there and then it's cancer. They did not know, of course. They have to do a FNA needle test to bring out a small sample. And that's what happened. Then finally, it was concluded, yes, it was cancer. And um, it hit you yeah. like a bomb. Still, I had a meeting I had to chair first in Mombasa. Ministers, East, Central, and Southern Africa. I was then the chair for the, that region, uh, Ministers of Health. And immediately I finished that. On a Saturday, we flew out on Monday, now for treatment. And when it, the tests were done and it was confirmed again that it was cancer, the doctors told me it was still stage one. Mm -hmm. It had not progressed. They did remove the gland here to check whether there was anything in the gland, nothing. And that was number one savior for me. So from there, then, of course, the treatment followed. Yeah. And at the end of it, which took, oh, about six months, quite a while, mm. a major operation was done and checked for cancer cells. There were none. And I was declared cancer free. So, so, so the lesson is early detection is key. Yeah. Early detection yeah. is yeah. very important. Yeah. And of course, also the choice of the treatment right. is also mm. important. Uh, they insist very much that they should not do a biopsy cut until when they are going to operate, mm. because there's a possibility of this now blood going to other parts uh, of the body uh, and take some cancer cells. Yeah, yeah. So the treatment is also, the, the, the handling, what they do is also important. Mm. But the main, main important thing is to catch cancer early. Yeah. And that you can only do through regular screening. screening. I want to touch a bit on your leadership journey, if I may. You have some powerful women who write forwards in your book, mm -hmm. uh, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, the former president of Liberia, and of course, Joyce Banda. Mm -hmm. And there was a point where you did want to run for president. There's a point I did what? D want to run for president back in 2001. Yes. Mm -hmm. What was it about that time that you felt, I want to throw my hat in the mm -hmm. ring? 
Actually, the third former president you have mentioned, yes. Salif, Her Excellency Ellen Salif Johnson, came to Kenya to get me to stand for president. Oh. Ah. And I had said, no, no, no. She called me. She came and got a friend, took me to, we met her, we met at the Michuki Hotel, that is uh, Windsor mm. Hotel, that's where she was. And she said to me, Beth, <clears throat> we are thinking of which women in the region we can interest to stand for, we can support to stand for president. She herself was also a candidate then. And uh, we have come up with you in Kenya. I said, what? Mm -hmm. I said, <laughs> wow. And I said, well, you know, uh, this is a friend. We, it's not, we have very many people in my family who are ready and who can stand for president. <laughs> I said, that's all right. We also can have women from your family. So uh, I, we argued, we talked. And then somehow I said, OK, I will try. The, the drive was to get more women in the region, uh, breaking the glass ceiling, yeah. as we say. Yeah. And that's what it was about. Of course, I also have had that kind of a feeling in the past, before even then. And just to have somebody now confirming to me Yes, we think you are within this country the right woman to do that. I think it's mainly from my work uh, internationally and nationally and regionally with women. Yeah. Um, yeah, that was part of it. Tell me something. Uh, being a niece of Kenya's first president, Jomo Kenyatta, and cousin to former President Uhuru Kenyatta. <clears throat> was that a lot of pressure? Do you, do you think you were in the shadows or you had to prove yourself all the time? Um, no, not really. I don't think that I had to prove myself all the time. Uh, but I must say, my experience, especially during my uncle, uh, President Kenyatta, who we call father, older father, younger father, I don't know how to call him uncle. And you see a letter in that book yes. where I call my dearest daughter. Yes. Mm. He was writing from prison, from Lord I, I didn't feel that pressure, but being close to him and seeing how he was working the very beginning. This is now the foundation of the nation. Laying, it was quite an experience. And I think that got into me in one thing, how he was caring, especially about the people, the country. He, he did not spare any moment or any time for himself. And I think you know his history, how he had come, how he lived up uh, overseas, oh. just fighting or, uh, with the colonialists to get Kenya independent. He gave all. And I was very interested what makes him move, what, what is this that was driving him. And that got me to become interested I think in that. Whether it's to prove myself, <laughs> I'm not sure about that. <laughs> but maybe I had a little bit of a grain. Yes, of course. And <clears throat> if you remember, I, I had declared to stand for president before President Uhuru yeah. Yeah. did. Yeah. So I don't think my cousin put pressure on me. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, I was ready. I was, that's why I was telling Ellen, we have. I don't think I am the candidate in the family. Uh, we have many more other important or higher or able. Uh, and he said, why not women also in your, in your family? Mm -hmm. But it was not pressure. Don't think it was pressure, Jeff. Nice. Mm. I have to ask, because yeah. you've credited uh, your husband as the reason why you stayed in the limelight and public office as long as you did. Mm. You retired last year. Mm. How important was it to have 
his backing, his support? <clears throat> My husband? Yes. Oh, it was very, very important. And he did it so well. Mm -hmm. He was so committed to my, he did not mind that I was getting higher. He always used to say, because he was interviewed by a nation at one time, how he feels to have his wife as a minister. And uh, he said, oh, I'm very happy. Her, her success is my success. And that's something else he said. When I was ambassador, Beth supported me. Why can't I support her now? And my very first campaign in Dagoretti in 92, because you know I did not go in, mm. he wore my cap. You know, he was donning uh, my cap and campaigning for me. Even in the book, you see him with the microphone okay. campaigning for me. I mean, I'm raising my, yeah. <laughs> and uh, a lady even said to, to him, why should we elect a woman? What can she do for us? You see, the battle women had to fight. And uh, Nick was so shocked, was so surprised. He said, what? Because yeah, he thought he was doing the right thing, playing the right game for the women. And here is a woman saying, what can I do for them? Of course, the uh, people of Dagoretti and the women of Dagoretti, after that, after they elected me in 97, they found what a woman can do Indeed. for them. Yeah. Because I did a lot of development, and they kept on calling me back. Even now, they still call me back. Mm. Mm. So Nick was very proud of me, supported me a great deal. When the, I joined Kenya, I mean Business and Professional Women Club, then it was Nairobi only, not national. Mm. <clears throat> uh, we had just come back from, <clears throat> I keep on having allergy. Yeah. We had just come back from foreign service. And I said to the women, they talked to me, please contest, come and be the chair. And I said, no, we are, I'm too busy. We are just rebuilding ourselves again. We have been out too long. And they came home led by Virginia Kiruba, Mary Kamau, and others. And they talked to my husband, saying, can you persuade uh, Beth to, to, be, to stand for the chair? That's when now Decade for Women yeah. was coming to Nairobi. Mm -hmm. And he said, why not? As she says that she has a lot of work. And Nick said to me, to them, no, 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 no. She, I will talk to her. She will stand, and I will help her. And he never looked back. Wow. From then, all the way, mm. because I also established now the Kenya Federation of Business and Professional Women when I opened clubs around the country, he was always part and parcel and encouraging me. Mm. And even now, I miss him. Oh, yeah. mm. it's wonderful, wonderful. You pay glowing tribute to him. You know, at the book launch the other day, you had, I mean, all kinds of your fellow colleagues supporting you. Martha Karua, Charity Ngilu, mm. Zipporah Kitoni, Betty Tet, Rose Warohi, they were all there. And most of them were saying they want to follow in your footpaths you were, and write their own story. Mm. Is that what, are you encouraging that? Yes. Mm. Yes, because they have a lot to tell. The, some of the so-called uh, trailblazers which, on the women, which I'm um, included in there, they have a lot of experience. We came from very far. Phoebe Asio, mm -hmm. Julia Ojabo, mm -hmm. those ones have already written, even Kitoni has written. There's a lot they can tell. And my aim, and I believe theirs too, is because we haven't really reached where we should be going, we should still have more women in Kenya in high positions in leadership, because it's good for development for the country. Even the, the, the world asks us, especially Africa, what's wrong with Kenya? Out there, you shine so much. Back home, 
you are almost nowhere. Mm. When you came to the decade for women, Kenya led five thematic areas. Only one we did not read. And that's when they were saying, oh, what is this? Jane, the late Jane Keanu mm. did Wangari Matai environment, uh, Maguyu health, Gachukia education, and myself economic empowerment, president for the region, mm. and all those others. And a young girl then, Joyce Uber, she was the girl child. So Kenya women shine. And there's no reason we should not get a little bit higher. And I believe women contribute a lot in development. And it's not try to bring anyone down, not even the boy child. And something has been misunderstood. The boy child does not come down because the girl child is coming up. Right. They should both be able to come up we are mothers of both. And you ask me whether it's, I believe, my, my hope is that they should, the others should write. Yes, mm. the others should write their biographies and uh, memoirs, because it would help maybe to guide or to help others, other upcoming women leaders, that they still have a role to pick the other women and like we have done, and bring them up. That's how we fought so hard for parliament, yeah. to have more women. And we have them now, the mothers of the different counties until they can. And many other women issues. Uh, it did not matter at our time what party the woman was. Right. Yes, we fought for our parties, but women issues, it did not matter whether you are this party or that. And I hope that the new leadership will really continue that so that we can bring more women to leadership, more women on the, where the cake is shared, <laughs> the, the, the national cake is shared, the cabinet, all the leadership areas, the only arm of government, which I would say has done very well, mm. is really the um, justice, the courts, mm. the judges. We have the magistrates, the third arm of government. The others are wanting. So more memoirs, more autographies, more, because a memoir involves a lot of other things than just you. Yeah. It's the people, it's the situations, it's what was happening, it's what can be done, what we did. And I think that would help. The yeah. more, the better. And I hope, I want to encourage really the new leadership, the women leadership. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You were one of the founders of uh, Kewopa, and this was to help female MPs defend their voices. Yes. What word of advice encouragement would you give to those future leaders? You just talked about, and this is you passing the baton, essentially, through the book to the next generation of leaders. But what would you tell them in this moment? <clears throat> My message to the future leaders who are coming, it's not that we are fighting anyone. We are not fighting the men leadership, because you need both. We are not fighting for the girl child alone. We are fighting for proper development for Kenya. Mm. You cannot develop when more than half, because the gender, if you look at the gender, more than 50% are women. Mm. Yeah. So you cannot really develop total development when a big portion of that is either wallowing in poverty or they are the lead. They, they really don't have a voice. Mm. We need the voice. So there, I would hope that these leaders 
I'm very happy they get where they get, and higher than we even we have gotten. But pull the other women to come up with them, like a pyramid, not to just be up there by ourselves, yeah. but to have more and more is beneficial to the country, to the country development, and there are issues, mm -hmm. development issues, which can only be looked at by the woman eye, mm. and especially to do with families. Tell me something, um, if there's one thing that you would want people to remember Beth Mugo by, what would that be, one thing? I think it's, um, and I hope that's what I'll be, servant leadership. Servant leadership where by being a leader or you become a leader by God's grace and the people put you there. First and foremost to remember, it's not for your accreditation, for your glory, for your, elev just elevating yourself. First and foremost, it's those people who have put you there. What are their problems? What are their needs? What are they saying? Learn to listen also to the people. who They put you there with a lot of hope, a lot of trust, believing you are the best. So prove to be that best by supporting their hopes, their aspirations, by being Christ Jesus, he tells us, the, the book tells us, he, he washed his disciples' legs. And he told his disciples, the highest of you must be the lowest. And I think as a leader, since we pride ourselves at Christians, we are a Christian country. Of course, we also have the other, the Muslim and the Hindus and all the others, and they all uh, are religions, and I respect them. But I think majority in Kenya, maybe we have so many churches in this country. I think we should be able to follow that teaching of Christ, that even if you are the leader, you are the high one, you are the leader, you don't look down on anyone. Instead, you raise them up. Absolutely. I hope my leadership in Daguerre and in the nation has been that, that type. Absolutely. Leading with humility. Yeah, indeed. Senator, you know, this. We do a live show and we're, we're, we're talking to you live, but at the same time, people are responding live on Twitter. So we want to go to a bit of feedback and see what they have to say. Take a look at what they're saying. Yeah. Jay Mukraini saying, I salute Honorable Beth Mugo for coming out to publicly give her personal account on cancer in her memoir, which I read with keen interest in the recent newspaper. This is so informative since some victims treat it as a taboo. Absolutely, yeah. nice one. Uh, we also have uh, Emily Mutwiri who says, wow, I celebrate Honorable Beth Mugo, 84 years and still looking young, <laughs> jolly and healthy. I wish she shares the golden secret behind this, wishing her good health and long life to continue touching lives. She is an epitome of hope to many. All right, well, wonderful. Thank you. Well, uh, another one here, Okello saying, Vicky and Jeff, kindly pass my sincere greetings to the soft-spoken superwoman, mm -hmm. Beth Mugo. Urge her to stay strong in her quest of ensuring cancer patients live better lives. I'm absolutely certain that the Almighty God is very pleased with her efforts and determination. Oh, wow. Well done. Uh, oh, there's still one oh, more. One more, okay. Okay, Kay Gashima says, such an inspiring story from former Senator Honorable Beth Mugo on a Sunday evening after an awesome sermon earlier today in church. So encouraging. We need more of these. Thank Senator, you, thank you well all. Done. Well done, That's Senator. very done well. We've done well, and we wish you long life 
and keep, uh, yeah, keep doing what you do. I know you, this, this book is selling like hotcakes out there right now. <laughs> Today it did sell a lot in that they called for it at St. Andrews, mm. which is my church. Mm -hmm. And from, for two services, eight o'clock, no, nine o'clock and another 11, now adding until three, I was getting hope at four, and I've been signing, signing <laughs> there. I thank God, and I praise God yeah. that he allowed me to do this book. Well done, it's a good sign, it's a good sign. The book is available at uh, Nuria it. Books, a prestige bookshop, That's right. and most bookshops. Right. Grab yourself a copy of Early Bird, Beth Mugo, a memoir. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much. Thank you so thank much. Thank you, viewers. Okay. Thank you. God bless. God bless you too. Mm -hmm.